This is an update in my continuing coverage of the mysterious star KSC 8462852, or Tebby Star, or more correctly Boyajian Star, for September of 2021. A blast from the past to be sure to say those words again. Longtime listeners will remember that my very first video was on this star, and then the story died down, and it appeared to be a phenomenon of dust. But guess what? It's back to behaving inexplicably. This channel has gained several hundred thousand subscribers since those days when the story was hot, so I'll start with a rundown of what happened with the star, and then we'll get to the current new developments surrounding it. In 2011, the Kepler spacecraft recorded data on thousands of stars within a very specific and tiny field of view within the constellation of Cygnus. Kepler was a photometer, meaning that it measured the brightness of stars looking for tiny dips in light that indicated that an exoplanet had passed in front of its parent star. Thousands of exoplanets were found using this method, making for a resoundingly successful mission for Kepler. But it also collected an absolute mountain of other data requiring the help of amateurs known as the planet hunters to comb through light curves looking for transits. This citizen science program was also quite successful, alerting scientists to the presence of many exoplanets but there were also anomalies spotted by the planet hunters, and one of these was the star KIC 8462852. It's worth noting here that the reason that this star has a phone number is because KIC stands for Kepler Input Catalog, and was compiled for the mission, but in fact actually cataloged significantly more stars than the spacecraft could see. So Tabby star is number 8462852 in that catalog. It's also worth noting that automated searches of potential exoplanet transits actually threw the light curve of the star out. Only through a second human search of the data was this found. The light curve of the star was so strange, showing dips of up to 22% of the star's light, that the natural origin explanations that were advanced to explain it all fell short, opening the discussion up to the alien option that we were in fact seeing gigantic alien megastructures transiting the star. The light curves were such that if such things existed, then that's what they would look like to the Kepler spacecraft and its capabilities. And there were bizarre features in the light curves that added to the mystery, including one very defined clear feature at day 792 in the data that could have been interpreted as a gigantic isosceles triangle passing in front of the star. While nature can produce such shapes, such as a comet, it in itself was strange. It would have had to have been a comet knocked backwards to fit, which isn't impossible, but seemed odd. Even more so since it seems that a messy dust cloud did it. But a further paper released later on exocomets showed that they did not look like this in the Kepler light curves, and had a characteristic light curve profile of their own which is interesting in itself that the Kepler spacecraft was able to detect exocomets around other stars. All of this ticked a box in the astrobiology field because of an idea first advanced by astronomer Luke Arnold. Arnold's idea was that a cheap form of announcing your presence to others in the galaxy is by creating huge baffles of sorts, perhaps made of something like mylar, in a distinctive shape. That way, alien scientists with their own Kepler-like detectors might see it, and know that such a shape would not naturally occur. This could come in the form of triangles, squares, or even louvers that could be put in orbit of a star, and the light output could be varied in a distinct and unnatural way. With KSC 8462852 presenting such a weird shape, this possibility was tantalizing to say the least. But it all came to an end with further ground observations of the star. Dr. Boyajin and her team were able to continue studying the star through a Kickstarter campaign and continue to do so to this day. They obtained observations that showed that the light was being blocked unevenly at different wavelengths, meaning that the culprit had to be extremely fine dust, something less than particles of smoke. A solid megastructure, on the other hand, would block light out completely taking that potential off the table. But there's another mystery here. Measurements were taken to see if the star system was emitting an excess of infrared light. This is because dust, such as a protoplanetary disk, 
will absorb the light coming from its star and then re-emit it as infrared light. In other words, warm dust. But no such signature was found at this star, so that may mean that either the dust is very cold or is somehow below the threshold for infrared detection, but not for visual detection. This led to the hypothesis by Dr. Boyajin and team that this may be a case of cold comets disintegrating around the star. But even that was not a perfect fit, and now seems even less likely. Other options included dust in the interstellar medium, but that didn't quite fit either, and definitely doesn't seem to fit now. Another was it could be the star itself varying in brightness in a way we've never seen before, such as perhaps giant sunspots, but this did not pan out either. All explanations failed to explain this weird juxtaposition of dust around the star, but that's not the only aspect of strangeness here. The dust seems to be getting dustier. It was found that not only was KIC 8462852 experiencing transient dips in its light curve, but multiple photographic sky surveys stretching over the last hundred years have shown that the star is gradually dimming overall. This is odd in itself. Stars can dim on their own, such as what Betelgeuse did last year when it apparently belched out a huge dust cloud, but Tabby's star is a type F main sequence star, which aren't known for that kind of behavior. So with the dust dimming it, then the amount of dust must be increasing, or at least appear to, with measurable effects over a period of centuries. This is weird, since such a process would be expected to take far longer. Nature likes to work on geologic timescales for things like this, not human lifetime timescales. And there were plenty of other oddities, including a team looking for SETI laser signals, making only one detection, and it happened to be KIC 8462852. This was dismissed as probably being just an errant cosmic ray entering the detectors, and no signals in radio were detected, but it was an odd coincidence indeed. Since the Kepler data was taken and post-2015 when the star's activity was discovered, more data has been collected by both amateurs and professional observers, and there have been multiple subsequent dimming events at the star, including very short-term dips being seen over the last few weeks, after a period of quiet. This brings into the equation the question of periodicity. Are the dust clouds in orbit of the star, passing by repeatedly as they orbit. There was some initial suggestion for this advanced by Boyajian, but it was only ever a hint of periodicity. This may now have changed as more data has been collected. In a paper by Gary Sacco and colleagues, link in the description below, they predict a 1574 day or 4.31 year period to whatever is orbiting Tabby's star. This is interesting because that would place the material within the habitable zone of the star at a distance of just under three astronomical units, and further deep in the mystery of why no infrared was observed. That close to an F-type star would mean there should be obvious infrared radiation. There isn't. And then there is the question of how the dust is being generated. Given its size and the type of star, the dust should be blown out of the star system by solar wind very rapidly, a matter of weeks. So whatever is creating the dust must be replenishing it at a rate higher than what's being blown out, allowing for the overall long-term dimming effect. It's difficult to envision a process for how that could occur without invoking implausible natural explanations. And that leads us to the next strange attribute of this star. Boyajin and colleagues noted within the star's light curve that the dips exhibited a separation of multiples of 24.2 days. This is held, as a periodicity of 1574 days is 65 periods of 24.2 days. Spooky indeed, and this starts looking a bit technological, as in some kind of technosignature. So what might be going on here? Here is where I make a caveat. This is high speculation, and I am a science fiction author, not a scientist, so I can step a bit further than they can. But this is also highly unlikely, and what we are seeing is probably just some coincidence of natural origin, even though the coincidences continue to stack up. But since this star continues to throw curveballs, it's fun to speculate. 
This might be what some kind of alien asteroid mining operation under very efficient and controlled conditions might look like. Arranging asteroids for efficient mining might create a pattern like what was observed, and submicron dust might simply be tailings from the mining. If your tailings are so small that they get blown out of the star system from solar wind, then that's a good way to both get rid of your waste, but also extract every bit of material that you wish to from your mining. Say metals are your goal. It's hard to say what an alien civilization's mining capabilities are, but there are many reasons why they might mine asteroids. Firstly, it's easier to extract raw materials from an asteroid than it is a planet. This is because asteroids can be richer sources of metals like gold that tend to sink down into planets during their formations. In fact, most of Earth's surface gold was deposited by asteroids, and all the native gold that it had during formation sunk to the core when everything was molten. Secondly, it makes no sense if you want raw materials to go through the trouble of extracting them from a planet's gravity well, and shooting them up to space at great expense when you have plenty of asteroids richer in the materials that are much more easily accessible. This is becoming relevant to us. There have been ideas floated that it may now be profitable to mine asteroids for platinum group metals. But where asteroid mining becomes essential is when we start building large structures in space, such as O'Neill cylinders. If you build cities in space, launching the materials from Earth becomes costly pretty quickly, even with plummeting launch costs, in comparison to just getting the same materials from an asteroid. At some point, asteroid mining is our future. That's also likely to be the case for spacefaring aliens. This is especially important in the idea of self-replicating probes that use raw materials they gain from star systems to reproduce and colonize the galaxy, much like Earth life does. We are essentially biological von Neumann probes. Using this method could result in the entire galaxy being colonized or at least have a probe stationed in it within every star system in only a few million years at sublight speeds. The galaxy is only about 100,000 light years across, and self-repairing machines aren't as sensitive to the passage of time as short-lived biological humans. But asteroid mining falls short on one major point, heat. We should see the tailings glowing wildly in infrared, and we do not. So another option presents itself, that of mining a star itself. This is known as stellar lifting, and essentially what happens is the advanced civilization magnetically lifts material from the surface of a star, lets it cool, and then mines it for useful materials. Stars are actually good sources for raw materials, and often contain all manner of elements. The waste from this process could potentially explain the behavior of Tabby's star. It's unknown what the eventual outcome of all of this is. If the star continues its long-term dimming trend, then do we eventually come to a point of full extinction? Will the star simply blink out? That in itself is a method of SETI, looking for things that appear or disappear inexplicably in photographic plates, because nature tends not to do things like this with stars, without something dramatic happening like a supernova. Since this story broke, there have been other stars that at least superficially present light curves like KIC 8462852, but not exactly. And in fact, two examples of oddly behaving stars that may outdo Tabby's star have come to light. The first of these is the star HD 139139, which presents a light curve where numerous repeating transits like exoplanets was observed. The weird thing here is that there were too many of them, and all of the dips except two were all roughly the same size, meaning that the objects were all the same size except two which were twice the size of the rest. What's going on there remains a mystery. The other is a star doing something somewhat similar to KIC 8462852, but in a much more dramatic way. This is the star VVV WIT08, and the star is seeing dimming events on a much greater scale than KIC, in that up to 97% of the star's light being blocked during a dip. Further, this star passes the megastructure test that KIC did not, in that whatever is blocking the light is optically thick and looks like a solid object. There could also be very thick dust clouds blocking all frequencies of light from the star. 
It seems unlikely that we'll have answers on these bizarre stars anytime soon. KIC 8462852 has been in the discussion since 2015, and six years later it's still a curveball throwing mystery, even with more observations and data. And the story seems likely to get increasingly weirder as more observations come in, especially if there is an alien civilization involved in any of these cases. To arrive at a confident conclusion that we have unambiguously detected an alien technosignature is going to involve all sorts of weird results from observations. And it's worth saying that we don't know everything that can happen in star systems, and we learn something new about the subject all the time. We may simply not have thought of a viable natural explanation yet, but that doesn't mean there isn't one. But it is a fun thought exercise to speculate about the possibility of a distant alien civilization mining a star for materials 1500 years in the past, during the days of the fall of the Western Roman Empire. What that civilization has done to that star in the meantime is anyone's guess. We simply have to watch and wait for the next 1500 years to find out, which by that time, we might be doing the same thing to stars. Thanks for listening, I am Futurist and Science Fiction author John Michael Godier, currently reminiscing. The first video I ever posted on this channel was about KIC 8462852, and I was expecting maybe a few hundred views and maybe sell a book or two. Obviously I underestimated that, and it's been a whirlwind of two channels growing far bigger than I ever expected. There's been many things, including beautiful fan art, and even a song written about me by Snakes Have Legs, link in the description below. Thanks everybody, and shout out to the sleep crowd, I'm happy to help you drift off, and all of you that made this possible on both channels, and I look forward to many more years, decades if I can, of content creation. I'm happy as a clam in what I'm doing. Though I do wonder where that colloquialism came from. Do we really know the clams are happy? And be sure to check out my books at your favorite online book retailer, and subscribe to my channels for regular in-depth explorations into the interesting, weird, and unknown aspects of this amazing universe in which we live.